A few weeks ago, I was in San Francisco, finishing up morning meetings, running a little late, uh, and I wanted lunch. I had some peculiar reasons for having a faster lunch, a well-lit lunch, a quieter place. I pulled out that thing we carry in our pockets, that uh, supercomputer called uh, smartphone, and uh, after a few minutes, I used several tools, Google Maps, a couple other things. I find myself at a great lunch. An hour passes, and I'm leaving, and I realize I got the lunch I wanted at a place that was nearby. It met my many peculiar requirements, not too loud, not too quiet, big enough windows, not too bright, on and on. It was interesting to reflect on the fact that I didn't have to do much to get exactly what I wanted, and it was a little bit, once you think about it, spooky. I had, in essence, been hacked. Uh, but in a good way. I was happy about it. I'd gotten exactly what I wanted with very little effort because a lot of systems knew how to nudge me in the right direction. So what I'm going to talk about is whether or not this is good or bad, and reality is it's a little bit of both. So hacking. We all know what hacking is. Uh, most of the time we think about it as uh, humans hacking computers or computer systems in order to get uh, private data or to steal money or to uh, meddle in elections or maybe even to break electric grids, right? Um, on the other hand, there is another type of hacking which is pretty pervasive, and that is systems, and in particular what we'll maybe call narrow AI, machine learning systems, hacking us. That is to say when we interact with them, uh, giving them information, asking them for a search request, nudging us in a particular direction to do something. And, and to be clear, when I talk about you know, AI and machine learning in this context, I'm not talking about super AI. Uh, it doesn't take remarkable sophistication. It's not the robot overlords we might worry about ma ma many years from now. It's actually just sort of what we might call toddler AI. It is a system that undergirds or maybe fulfills entirely the responsiveness that we type into a system to get answers back. Uh, and it gets to do that billions of times a day, and it has very narrow objectives. Um, this isn't something particularly new. In fact, humans hack humans all the time. It's, when it's well done, we call it uh, effective salesmanship uh, or, or uh, charismatic leadership, uh, maybe a good pickup line or a, a very uh, effective toddler. In fact, you know, when a toddler throws a tantrum and, and, and we give the little tyke exactly what he wants and then he immediately stops, we know we've been had, right? So there's that moment uh, where you realize, gosh, uh, I've been hacked. There are lots of ways in which humans influence humans, and it kind of ports its way into the uh, systems and artificial intelligence world. Uh, I, I picked five, and they are uh, the idea of framing, the idea of uh, scarcity, including a little bit of fear of missing out, social proof, reciprocity, and ultimately false choice. Let's dive into the first three. Um, one way of thinking about what happens is uh, when we make a decision is how it's framed. So you've probably used this technique. Maybe it's been used against you. Let's imagine that you have an 18-year-old daughter. She's gone off to college. She's a freshman in college, and she hasn't written in a little while. Of course, she's never written a letter or a long email. It's all in text, and today you get a series of texts, and they start out with, hey, dear mom and dad, sorry I haven't been in touch with you. I was really busy being a college student. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I had to drop out because when my boyfriend and I were at the tattoo parlor, his drug dealer confronted him and he shot him. But don't worry, the baby will be born after I get out of prison because it's a pretty short sentence. I know you're really disappointed in me. I'm really, really sorry. Love your daughter. P.S. Uh, none of the above is true. Um, I'm really busy studying for finals. I don't even have a boyfriend. But I have run out of money. <laughs> And I wonder if you wouldn't send me $2,000. And your reaction is, send her $2,000 right now, right now. And why is that, right? Well, you were just told that all those facts above were not true, and yet you cannot escape the frame. Your brain responds and anchors itself in a lot of ways. You are happier. You feel that it is more correct to send the $2,000. So beware. Um, in a car sales situation, you walk into a dealership and you say, hey, I'm here to buy a very sensible you know, family sedan, four doors, what have you got? And the salesperson, she takes you to the first car, it's a really nice car, she you know, talks about it for a few minutes and you see the sticker and you're like, oh, and she's like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great car though and it's kind of a high price. She says, well, let me, let me show you something else then. Let's you know, walk a little bit farther down the row and then you know, she shows you the next thing and it's about half the price and you say, now that's a bargain. 
Uh, part of the reason you feel that that's a bargain is because it was framed as a setup relative to the first price. So what does an e-commerce site do, for example? Well, first, it gets a chance to practice this and refine this placement and refine the settings and the sizing and the pricing a billion times a week, not just a few dozen, by the way. And what it does is it sets up a, on your search a nice item, maybe a little bit more than you asked for, a bundled item that's definitely a higher price point, and then a click here for your special price. You click there. And wow, that's a special price. It's a bargain. But part of the reason it's a bargain is because of that setup. Same thing with scarcity. That same salesperson, she walks you to, uh, actually, she walks you to another car and says, oh, look at this car. I didn't know it was still here. Now, this is a fantastic car. This is a great car. It's, oh, it's sold. I'm so sorry. I, did, I didn't see it. Let's go searching for another car. AI, on the other hand, when you search on a website, might say, oh, flash sale, five minutes, four minutes and 59 seconds, four minutes, 58 seconds. Or it might say, uh, oh, sorry, wait list only. It's always wait list only, but it's wait list only. And then finally, social proof, or a little bit of fear of missing out. Sometimes that same salesperson will be like, oh, wait, wait, let's go over here. See that crowd over there, very good looking, hip people around that car? Let's go look at that one. And by the way, there it is on the cover of that magazine. You're going to love this car. Everybody loves this car. It just flies off the lot. On the other hand, in the artificial intelligence machine learning world, you might end up on a site, and it says, ooh, 32 of these booked today, right? Preferred, recommended, most popular. These are all methods in which you are influenced. So what's the big difference between the systems, machine learning otherwise, versus people? So first is magnitude. The chance not to do this 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 times and learn from it, but to do this a billion times a week, to have that opportunity. So if your toddler could experiment on you a million times a day and learn and remember from those experiences, how good would he be at getting exactly what he wants every day from you? He'd definitely be better. The second advantage is that the systems live in a simpler world. So optimize clicks and engagement, end of story. The salesperson has to go home and chat with her husband and say, I think I sold this nice family like way too much car today. I feel a little bit bad about that. And the third and maybe most important difference is that what you expect when you walked into the car dealership, even if you said, I'm just looking, I don't plan to buy, you all knew they were going to try to sell you a car. You were not going to try to buy a car, but they were going to try to sell you a car. It was understood what was going on. But in the machine learning language system, where you have this environment of you're asking for things, you're getting things, the gap between what you think you're getting and what's being done to you might be very large. In fact, think about the car dealership. If afterwards you found out that the car dealership actually never sold any cars, instead what they were doing is they were watching you follow all the different cars, look at colors, look at lights, you know, have certain sounds, have different temperatures, and they were recording your response to that. If you found that out after the fact, you'd be pretty upset. So let's turn maybe to like YouTube. It is definitely not the case that when you put in search terms for YouTube that you are in fact getting back the enlightened, truthful, most helpful versions of those search terms that you put into YouTube. That might be a part of it, but in reality, that system, which is undergirded by narrow AI, is maximizing for clicks and for engagement, for clicks and engagement, and that's it. Um, and so in the process, it might dish up a lot of good stuff for you, but it's not trying to help you be enlightened. That's not the goal, a big gap. And so this brings up two other areas of influence. One, something we call reciprocity, and two, something that we call false choice. So it's a well-known human behavior, and probably a really good thing for our species, that when someone comes to you and gives you an unsolicited gift that is neither transactional nor a bribe, for a period of time, you are much more likely to say yes to whatever they ask for next. You are, in a sense, more vulnerable to whatever they want you to do next. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's a well-known observation. In the YouTube context, you've just submitted a request. And it might have been really hard for you to do personally, and it gave you back what you wanted or what you think you wanted. And that is the opportunity for the reciprocity. And then, if you do the search at home, by the way, go ahead and try it. Try source of or cause of Napa fires. And do it once with from mainstream news and once without saying from mainstream news. The results will be very similar. So doing the result sets up the reciprocity. You get some results. And interestingly, if you said from mainstream news, you won't get any mainstream news. 
There's a lot of possible explanations for this. It's hard to understand what an artificially intelligent system is learning and recoding itself to do, so we can't say exactly. But it might be that people who search in that way for mainstream news are what we call confirmatory searchers. They hardly even ever click. They get what they wanted and just the results and they move on. The system loses, so it learned not to give you any of the mainstream news. It dishes it up without mainstream news and then you and I both know what happens. You're like, wow, I really wonder how the North Koreans use those lasers to burn down the redwood forest. And you end up clicking and staying and engaging. And it gets to practice how to do this to you millions, sometimes billions of times a day. And the false choice part is kind of intriguing, and it is the following. You made a request, you got something back for free, that makes you feel good, you're open to suggestion, there are a bunch of suggestions, but it did not answer any of your question about mainstream news at all. And yet there's some choices, and we know as a function of how we work as humans, when confronted with choices all else equal, we feel better about choosing even if the answer was effectively, no, sorry, try again, here's some other choices. And so why do we care about that? Why do we worry about it? Well, one possibility is that we've sort of unleashed a genie that we need to understand better. So we've all heard the stories. Uh, you make a wish to a genie, careful what you ask for. So as an example, you might say, hey genie, all I want is a little bit of peace and quiet. And so the genie kills everyone and strikes you deaf. <laughs> so from an engineering viewpoint, this was really robust and durable, right? So you got exactly what you asked for, but probably not what you wanted. So when you take a system and you say, hey, maximize clicks and engagement, and practice a billion times a day, remember everything you ever did that worked and didn't work, and then permute, right? Then figure it out. So here's what we really lose sleep about and that is the sixth hack. What is the thing that isn't like humans do to humans? What if it's radically different? Does something like that exist? And as it turns out, we think it might. So there are five ways I mentioned to be manipulated, but I think we should lose a little bit of sleep over the sixth one that we don't yet recognize or don't yet know. If you look at this screen, and I say, hey, describe those two colors, the blue, the green, what would you describe them as? You'd come up with lots of things, but one thing you wouldn't do is you wouldn't say, Oh, as it turns out, I, I think they're both green. You wouldn't say that, and this is a known visual illusion. There's lots of those. It gives hints at things that might be built into us that a system, once it found it, could utilize to trick us. The real, reality is that blue and that green, they're the same color, RGB0, 255, 150. They really are. Look it up, it's kind of cool. There's a lot of these. Your brain is being tricked, don't lose sleep about it, into seeing those as two different colors. Why do we care about that? Well, it might turn out that across billions and billions of experimental efforts, there are opportunities and times when you might be convinced, because of something unexpected, to buy more instead of less, to buy now instead of later, to say blue instead of green, to say yes instead of no. And that's worth worrying about, what to do about it. Well, two easy things, I think. One, we now know we're supposed to pay more attention to what systems gather about us, right? So we want to know what information is being gathered. We want to know who and what it's shared with. And finally, let's just add this one. Tell us what it's actually trying to get us to do. Is it trying to get us to understand things or stay on a site longer? And then finally, just apply a little bit of traditional skepticism to interacting with these systems. So when someone shows up your door and rings your doorbell and has gifts, like a big basket for you that's free, you don't necessarily slam the door, but you do wonder, hmm, strangers bearing gifts, if it's too good to be true, we have all the training for this. Let's just apply it a little bit more to our interactions with these systems that give us this information or nudge us to do things. I'm actually quite optimistic about the bright future of applications for artificial intelligence, including this narrow toddler AI. And in fact, if there's a way that you can make it so that when I search to order candy online, I get tricked into exercising for an hour instead, <laughs> I, I'm all for it. And I ask only two things. One, that I opted into it. And two, that I know the system's trying to do that to me. Thanks very much.